We stand with the people of Orlando who have endured a terrible attack on their city. All I heard was the bang, 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 and I just looked and the person next to me was shy. This is probably the most difficult day in the history of Orlando. No one can tell me where my son is. So everyone is screaming, going out. This was an act of terror and an act of hate. And we will not be defined by a hateful shooter. We'll be defined how we support and love each other. Live pictures now of a community in mourning, a vigil getting underway right now for the 50 lives lost and 53 others hurt in the Pulse nightclub mass shooting. While the pain felt here in City Beautiful is heartbreaking and deep, we are definitely not alone. Our coverage begins with a nationwide moment of silence beginning in just a matter of seconds for those who lost their lives too soon to violence. I'm Ginger Gadsden. Good evening to you. I'm Eric Von Ank, and thanks for being with us on this very difficult Sunday. And I'm Matt Austin. Now, during the silence, images of the victims, those caught in the chaos, and those who stepped up and helped. Join us and pay respect. A somber day for Orlando with a vow for quick action from the FBI to try and figure out why 29-year-old Omar Mateen would open fire at the Pulse nightclub along South Orange Avenue. We are learning a lot more about his final moments alive from the FBI, including a call to 911 pledging his allegiance to ISIS. Also, new information about the weaponry he used, including the guns he purchased just days before the attack. But still, why it happened and who it has impacted for that we have team coverage for you tonight investigator erica washington with families waiting for answers mike deforest digging into this suspect's past and amanda castro live at the hospital where dozens are in surgery some in grave condition let's begin though with news six's mike holfeld near the crime scene with the latest from detectives mike Matt, good evening, everyone. Deadly intentions, deadly consequences, and now the awful task of removing the dead. It has been a difficult day for us, starting at 2 a.m. until now. Let me set the scene for you with this video, the video we've seen over and over again. It was supposed to be a celebration, Latin night at the Pulse Night Club, Orange Na Ave Avenue. A little after 2 a.m., FBI investigators say Omar Mateen, with rifle and handgun in tow, opened fire. Bodies, people scrambling. Fast forward to 5 a.m., 11 OPD officers exchange gunfire, killing Mateen. But his mission of hate was completed. More than 50 men and women dead tonight. The city in a mood of both healing and defiance. We want the citizens and residents and visitors of Orlando to know that we are committed to their safety. Our officers put themselves in harm's way and risk their lives for the people and patrons at Pulse and we are committed to do so again. And we will not be defined by a hateful shooter. We'll be defined how we support and love each other. Anybody that's thinking about doing something like this in our state, our, um, our justice is swift, our penalties are severe. We have a great law enforcement team and we're gonna do the right thing. FBI agents confirmed to News 6 that Mateen did call 911 and that there was a reference to ISIS and his allegiance to ISIS. A U.S. citizen, but somehow that U.S. citizen turned against us, America. He got guns a few days ago, according to the ATF, and delivered that deadly intentions and the deadly consequences. Ginger, back to you. So much of this, Mike Holfeld, not making any sense right now. Thank you for that live report. Now, the investigation into this horrific act stretches nearly 120 miles south of Port St. Lucie. The FBI and law enforcement at this home of the suspected killer, 29-year-old Omar Mateen,
We're going to check in with our reporter Troy Campbell in just a few minutes, live at this site with what investigators and detectives are telling us. First, though, investigator Mike DeForest with more on the suspect's past. Well, Matt, so far we've not found anything that would tie Omar Mateen to Central Florida, so it's still unclear why he drove nearly two hours from that home in Fort Pierce to kill people here in Orlando. The 29-year-old who committed America's deadliest mass shooting had no prior criminal record, but federal authorities have known about Omar Mateen for years. The FBI first became aware of Martin in 2013 when he made inflammatory comments to co-workers alleging possible terrorist ties. Agents say they thoroughly investigated the matter, interviewed Mateen twice, and even spied on him. Ultimately, we were unable to verify the substance of his comments, and the investigation was closed. But the following year, the FBI learned Mateen had ties to this fellow Floridian, Moner Abdu Salah, an American citizen who carried out a suicide bombing in Syria. We determined that contact was minimal, and did not constitute a substantive relationship or a threat at that time. So Mateen was allowed to keep his Florida license, allowing him to work as an armed security guard. According to this newsletter, for at least five years, Mateen has been employed by the private security form G4S, which provides security officers to government buildings and courthouses. Mateen, a U.S. citizen, was born in New York, but he attended middle school and high school in Port St. Lucie, as seen by these yearbook photos obtained by News 6. Mateen's parents are from Afghanistan. In this YouTube video posted last year, his father talks Middle East politics. Mir Sadiq told reporters the Orlando massacre had nothing to do with religion, but instead his son's opposition to homosexuality. Now, we've spoken to a few of Mateen's former classmates. They say he was a troublemaker in school and occasionally got into fights, but they tell us they never saw any behavior with the, that would lead them to believe he would someday be a mass murderer. And Mike Mateen had two guns, an AR-15 assault rifle, a 9mm handgun, and he purchased those legally, right? Uh, perfectly legally. We're told he bought them in just the last few days, and even though... The FBI acknowledges that it had investigated him twice. He was still allowed to have those guns, still allowed to have that Florida armed security guard license. All right. Mike DeForest, thank you. Well, now to the victims. What started early this morning as 20 lives lost, more than doubled very quickly to 50, making this the deadliest mass shooting in U.S. history. And that awful title was announced by Orlando Mayor Buddy Dyer during one of the first updates that we got today. Today we're dealing with something that we never imagined and, and is unimaginable. Since the last update, we have gotten better access to the building. We have cleared the building, and it is with great sadness that I share we have not 20 but 50 casualties. In addition to the shooter, there are another 53 that are hospitalized. And Mayor Dyer later announced the city would launch this website, updating the names of those who were killed after their family members had been notified, of course. We're already finding out a lot of the heartbreaking details about several of the victims. Julie Broughton is here now with their stories. Julie. Eric, we've closely been monitoring this list as names are released, and here's a look at some of those victims. Here's Edward Sotomayor, Jr. He's from Sarasota. That's his picture you see right there. And looking at his Facebook page, friends are paying tribute to him today. He was a national brand manager for a travel company that plans gay vacations. He was 34 years old. Here is Stanley Almodovar. He was just 23 years old. He lived in Claremont, and according to his Facebook page, he was from Springfield, Massachusetts. According to his Instagram profile, it looks like he may have worked in the pharmacy industry. And we also just got this picture in the last 20 minutes. This is Juan Guerrero. He's 22 years old. This photo comes from his Instagram page. Here's a look at all the victims names we've learned so far. Other names include Louis Omar Ocasio Capo. He was 20 years old. Eric Ivan Ortiz Rivera, 36 years old and Peter Gonzalez Cruz, age 22. Now we are looking, working to learn more about all of these victims along with any other names that are released throughout the night. And as soon as we learn more, we will let you know right here on News 6 on ClickOrlando.com and on our News 6 mobile app.
All right, Julie, thank you. We will continue to update you on those victims. Already, we're learning help is coming in the form of a GoFundMe account. Equality Florida launched the site to help the victims looking for $500,000, and there has already been nearly $400,000 raised. That money to help the families of the victims and those who are fighting for their lives right now at Orlando Regional Medical Center. And that's where News 6's Amanda Castro is. And Amanda, for a while, the hospital was on lockdown earlier today when we didn't, of course, know exactly what was going on. Any update now from doctors? Well, Eric, we did just find out within the last hour that the hospital lockdown has been lifted. We are still kind of waiting to get some latest numbers, but what has been reported to us today is that 44 people were admitted here to ORMC after the shooting. We've learned that nine of nine people did die here at the hospital. Now, when we got out here, we saw lots of family and friends rush here trying to get any information on their loved ones. And many of the people we spoke to were actually there last night at the club when the gunman opened fire. Several medical helicopters dropping off victims at ORMC, the level one trauma center taking in 44 people from the Pulse nightclub shooting. The victims suffering assault rifle gunshot wounds to their torso, their arms, legs, and abdomen. Doctors performed 26 operations. We're told nine people died from their injuries. Families, friends, and loved ones arrived to the hospital, all trying to get any information on the victims. Many were there when Omar Mateen opened fire. And people were trying to jump on top of him, but he was just shooting everywhere, and we couldn't take that risk, so we were going through the back, but it was horrible. It was a bloodbath. It was terrifying. Andrew Allman says he left the club 15 minutes before the shooting started. He tells us five of his friends were killed. They were beautiful people, and they didn't deserve that at all. And I pray that when, when they go to heaven, that they see everybody that cares for them. Orlando's first openly gay commissioner, Patty Sheehan, reacting to the horror. This isn't just a story. These are people, and this is where they died. And, you know, I mean, it, it, it's, it's very, very emotional for me and, you know, for this community. Back out live, you can see the road. Uh, Orange Avenue is by the hospital, obviously still blocked off. The lockdown here has been lifted again within the past hour. The hospital is accepting patients into the, its emergency room, and we're told all operations are back to normal now. Orlando police is holding steady, saying that there are confirmed 50 people dead from last night's shooting. If you're still trying to figure out information, if you're still trying to figure out if one of your loved ones may be one of those victims, the city has set up a, a special assistance hotline that number you're going to want to call is 407-246-4357 eric and it was just a few people identified so far amanda you know a lot of families waiting on work tonight thank you and you saw there amanda is stationed at ormc which right here on this map it shows it's just a few blocks away from the pulse nightclub and it's also just across the street from the hampton inn that's where investigators are urging family members to go and wait for answers our erica washington continues our live team coverage there with the families that are on standby erica lots of loved ones hoping for some sort of clarity and in many cases hoping that it won't end the way that they fear. And Eric, unfortunately, I can tell you a little while ago, a team of doctors walked over here from ORMC into Hampton Inn, um, met, I'm assuming, with the families, and then um, family members came out just devastated, crying, um, holding one another, uh, praying out loud. It, it was just such an emotional sight to see. Unfortunately, I believe that most likely many of the family members were told that their loved ones didn't make it, um, and they were told who was in the hospital. Now, we have not confirmed all of the list of people that unfortunately did not make it and passed, but I can tell you from the looks of people that I talked to earlier, I talked to a Natalie who was looking for her 23-year-old baby sister. Um, we had showed her picture a little earlier when I had done an interview and um, she came out devastated, crying, sobbing hysterically. So, you know, I didn't obviously want to go up and bother and ask her what happened, but it did not obviously seem good. Um, you know, we did talk to a number of people still coming here, still hopeful. You know, it, behind me is a, a bunch, of, and I'm going to step out of the way, uh, family members still congregating here. Many, I think, just w still wanting to be here, wanting to be around the scene, hoping that they'll hear some news momentarily. But at this point, uh, many people are still coming here asking questions. If you take a listen, here's what a couple people had to tell me a little earlier. When did you realize that your brother was missing? 
when uh, I get tired of the missing calls this morning and I realize something was wrong. So I get on, on social media because of the, of the show that we had. I, di I mean, I didn't realize none of that. Then when I said, when I saw what it was, it, that's when really reality hits you really, really bad. My best friend, brother, he was uh, with two guys, two friends at the club. Uh, they heard the shots, they thought it was the music. Two of them lay down on the floor. I don't know if they was trying to make believe that they was already hit. And they said that when they looked back, they saw Jimmy in a people wall. Seems that the guy stand them all over, I don't know, and when he started shooting. So they start running, but Jimmy couldn't make it. So you know, he did he pass? I'm sure, I don't, I don't have information, but this morning, someone ripped my arms out of me. I know he's gone. I'm just here because he's lying there in the floor and I just want to bring him home. Everybody responded. Everybody responded that they were okay except Jimmy and Alex. Finally, when I got in touch with Alex, Alex says, I'm okay, but Jimmy is not. Um, he, he was left behind. So at the club, he and his friend left. They they didn't they didn't they, they couldn't find him. They couldn't find him. They know that he had fallen because they saw him from a difference, and they he, they were running out. You know, all the running, they were pushing them out that way. Heard, heard anything from? No, we haven't heard anything. Not anything yet. What are they telling? Uh, what are they telling you, if anything? They're not telling us anything yet. They're telling us just to sit and wait. And how has this wait been? It's been devastating. Devastating waiting. There's a lot of grief in there. There's a lot of devastation. A lot of Latinas and Latinos in there just the waiting for the opportunity to hear something from their loved ones. Uh, are, 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 how many families would you say are in there? Well, I couldn't begin to tell you. It's a lot of people. A lot of people are in there. Are they a lot of praying, a lot of crying? A lot of praying, a lot of crying. There's a lot of chaplains and priests and um, pastors in there as well. Again, back live, you're looking, people are interviewing someone that has a, possibly a family member, but you can see the media is not allowed on Hampton's property, Hampton Inn's property, so that's why as family members are coming out, those who choose, who want to share, who want to talk about their loved one, of course, we are stepping in and talking to them. We will be here all night long to give you the latest, but at this point, if you have any questions, you can call that toll-free number that you see at the bottom of the screen, or you, can, of course, can come down here to Hampton Inn, located right down the street from ORMC. Reporting live in Orange County, Erica Washington. Back to you, Eric. That is a very tough place right now, Erica. And we got to remember all those people behind you are our friends and neighbors. Thank you. Mm -hmm. We'll check in with you again. Yeah, you hear sit and wait. Those are the three oh, toughest words to hear right now. Yeah. Try telling and, them yeah. that. Yeah. And as families wait for answers, the community is not waiting to get results. No, they came out in force. Sky 6 captured the long lines outside this blood bank. Look at that. It wrapped around the center on Michigan mm -hmm. Street. The support's so vast. One blood is now at capacity. They're asking people to come back in the coming days so they can kind of spread out their resources. News 6 reporter Brittany Harris joins us there live. Brittany, what an outpouring of support we saw out there today. Matt, it has been an incredible day out here. I can't even believe all the support we have seen. Uh, as you mentioned, we are over here at One Blood off West Michigan in Orlando, and you can see there are a ton of people behind me in line. This group will be the last of the day to donate blood. Uh, as we said, the outpouring of support really has been incredible. Everyone says they want to do their part to help after this unfortunate tragedy. No negative. Thousands of people are donating their blood after the mass shooting at Pulse nightclub in Orlando. This was the line at One Blood off West Michigan. It was extremely busy all morning, but now it's calming down. Many people were asked to come back later. One Blood says they want to focus on getting O positive and O negative blood types as well as AB for plasma. O blood types are universal, so they can be used on anyone in a trauma situation. While we were out at one blood we ran into a man who was at the nightclub last night he heard the gunshots and says he ran out as fast as he could sadly though he hasn't heard from his friend chris summers who he was with it's hard to sit here and know that 
he had ties to ISIS, they had pledged to whatever you want to call it. Like, why take it out on an innocent group of people that did nothing to anybody? I just, I don't get it. Doesn't make sense. The hospitals are doing okay on blood supplies for right now, but the need for blood donations is still urgent. Anyone interested in donating can make an appointment online. The volunteer efforts out here have been absolutely incredible. People have been bringing cases of water and food, and there are food trucks here and a hot dog stand. Bo Outlaw, retired Orlando Magic basketball player, was also out here lending a hand. So as you can see, the community is really pulling together during this difficult time. Brittany Harris, New 6. All right, Brittany Harris, thank you. You can get updates and results, donate blood. We have posted the details, including hours and locations, as well as the number to reach one blood. It's on our website. That's clickorlando.com, powered by News 6. You'll find it right there under Top Stories. And these were the very long lines we saw earlier at One Blood. Yeah, we're getting new information now. We've been bringing you updates on the names of the victims as we have, as we have received them. This is the latest name, Luis S. Belma, 22 years old. And his name has now been added to the six names that we knew about earlier, and all of them remarkably young. Edward Sotomayor Jr., 34 years old. Stanley Aldemabar III, 23. Luis Omar Ocasio Capo, 20 years old. Juan Ramon Guerrero, 22. Eric Ivan Ortiz Rivera, 36 years old. And Peter O. Gonzalez Cruz, 22 years old. All day local, state, and federal leaders have been, of course, keeping us updated. They've been weighing in and they've been offering their support. Yeah, well, Governor Rick Scott has declared a state of emergency. President Obama talked about the situation at the White House. Here is some of the president's emotional remarks. As a country, we will be there for the people of Orlando today, tomorrow, and for all the days to come. We also express our profound gratitude to all the police and first responders who rushed to harm's way. Their courage and professionalism saved lives and kept the carnage from being even worse. It's the kind of sacrifice that our law enforcement professionals make every single day for all of us, and we can never thank them enough. Now, the president also described the gunman as, quote, a person filled with hatred. He says federal investigators are working to learn more about his ties to terrorist groups. Meantime, there has been a lot of response to this mass shooting from around the world today. That includes the Vatican. A statement issued this afternoon reads in part, quote, the terrible massacre that has taken place in Orlando with its dreadfully high number of victims has caused in Pope Francis and all of his and all of us the deepest feelings of horror and condemnation. Pope Francis joins the families of the victims and all of the injured in prayer and in compassion. And back here in Orlando, local and state leaders have also talked about Central Florida's incredible resolve as we deal with this horrific tragedy. This state is going to be defined as a state of generosity, a state of love. Um, we are a resilient state. Uh, we love people in our state, and we're going to continue to do that. I also want to take this opportunity to thank all of uh, the outpouring of support, not only from local law enforcement. Uh, you know, we've had uh, multiple sheriffs from different counties uh, respond, uh, different police chiefs. Everyone in Central Florida has reached out to us. But also, I want to thank the uh, businesses in this area. They have all stepped forward to assist uh, law enforcement with food, with water. Uh, so uh, we really do appreciate that. You can get a closer look at the response to the mass shooting on ClickOrlando.com, powered by News 6. We'll continue to keep you updated as new information comes in, that is for sure. Congressman John Micah says he's asking tough questions tonight, including how did Omar Mateen slip through the cracks if the FBI was keeping tabs on him? And Micah also said that he's been asking for more money from the feds for months now to protect Central Florida and its so-called soft targets, places like the theme parks and sports stadiums. But he says the Department of Homeland Security didn't think the risk of an attack was high. Uh, I'm turning my attention to uh, how this could uh, have happened. 
and uh, I'm asking some uh, pointed questions already today. Congressman John Micah says he was afraid of something like this. Oh my God. A terrorist attack on Central Florida. He said so in this letter he wrote back in January to the Secretary of the Department of Homeland Security after Orlando's police chief and Orange County Sheriff asked him for help. They came to me and said, um, We've been taken off the DH, uh, DHS uh, list, the Har Department of Homeland Security list, for extra resources. There's an urban security uh, program, and they whacked Orlando. We've been fighting together, and we got rejected again in January. I've been appealing, along with several other members of Congress, that we get the resources we need. We may be a soft target, but we've seen that we are a target, and we were concerned because we have so many tourists. Uh, Micah first wrote Homeland Security after it downgraded the risk of an attack on Central Florida and at the same time downgraded federal funding to pay for local security programs like intelligence, search and rescue, hazardous materials, explosives, and training exercises to respond to an attack. Micah wrote in his letter, quote, Central Florida is a target of opportunity and vulnerable to all types of terrorist activities if Central Florida became a target, it would be a national disaster. They denied us those resources. <laughs> I want those resources in our community. Maybe we could have had the extra p patrols. Maybe we could have had the extra resources. Email the Department of Homeland Security to ask about Micah's letter you saw in the story. Yeah. I also called the press office. It went to voicemail. It is a Sunday. I will keep following up with them until I get an answer. What he was in, he was in the studio live with us earlier today, and yeah. he you could feel the anger when he talked about how he had been pressing them yeah. to get help. And that letter was dated January. It was January, January 17th, and it was chilling. The words mm -hmm. now, you, you heard the words as, as I read them from the yeah. letter. Yeah. I, and you have to wonder if this is going to change protocols in the future. You know, this guy was investigated by the FD, FBI twice in the last five years on two separate occasions, yet just a matter of days ago he was able to buy these two guns. Yeah. Uh, and right. those could possibly be the ones he used. And already, sure. Micah said he had asked for help from the feds two times, and he says he's going back for a third. Yes, and he was concerned in his letter, like I said, about specifically areas where tourists visit. He didn't see this coming, but no one did. That's the point. It's almost eerie. That's the point. Yeah. yeah. All right. Thanks, Eric. Well, we want to get back out to Mike Holfeld now, who is live, who has more on this investigation now. And Mike, you asked the FBI, this is what we were just talking about with Ginger and Matt here, you asked them what they knew about Mateen before today. Well, that's right. Uh, good evening, everyone. Mateen was not on the Homeland Security list in 2016. That's the punchline to the story, as Congressman Mike alluded to, as Eric was just discussing. But the FBI was focusing on this guy. He had their attention, not once but twice, 2013, 2014. And then, believe it or not, two weeks ago, he's able to get those weapons. According to the FD FTF, quoting now, he bought a couple of weapons, just like that. He wouldn't tell me what store, but here's a guy that was being interviewed by the FBI, and he has access to the weapons. And those weapons probably used in the deadly results that left all those lives lost. So the question is, why did he do it? Let's begin with the FBI. We talked about the 911 call, and it's confirmed. Does that mean the 911 there were 911 calls in which there was conversation between the subject and uh, law enforcement representatives of 911 dispatchers. Uh, that has become federal evidence. Was there a declaration of allegiance to anyone, or can you share that with us? It was, it was, uh, as my, it's my understanding, I have not personally listened to him, but it was general to the Islamic State. What's your take on that, sir, a nightclub? People there having fun. And Senator, you know what happened. We have 50 people dead at least. Yeah, it's heartbreaking. These people had plans today. They were they were planning to be somewhere today, and they're not going to get there. And others who were injured that are not going to get there. The human cost of it is extraordinary. It's, I think it's the single largest mass killing in American history. Um, Do we but, need to step up the vetting process? I mean, this guy worked at GNC. He was a well, I don't know all the yeah. A, I don't a, know all the details right. behind what, but but the, that's why right. the homegrown violent extremist is so difficult. You can't predict what they're going to do. 
Background checks tell you what someone has done in the past. They can't predict what they might do in the future. This is an individual that the FBI was aware of and looked into and monitored and didn't find actionable. And I can tell you that there are hundreds of cases like this all across the country. Yeah, Mike, I, it's unfathomable for me. I, I, I tell you, I, my office is right across the street. I drive by the Pulse every day. Uh, and I, I just... I'm standing here with you in the street, and it's a, it's just a surreal experience. We're knowing that there's still people that, are, that I think they're still removing bodies from the from the building. So hard to fathom.